Welcome to Real Mushrooms, Mason's Medicinals interview series. Today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Dennis McKenna. Dr. Dennis McKenna has conducted research in the ethnopharmacology world for over 40 years. We are very excited and lucky to have him. He is a founding board member of the Hefter Research Institute, and he was a key investigator on one of the first biomedical investigations of ayahuasca. He is the younger brother of Terrence McKenna, a huge innovator and well-known human in the psychedelic space. Dennis is the author of also a few key textbooks and novels around ethnopharmacology and medicinal mushrooms. He is the visionary behind the McKenna Academy of Natural Philosophy. Dennis, what were some of the key resources and life events that set you up for pursuing a life in ethnopharmacology? I kind of got off on a tangent there as I as I tend to do. So people can read about the experiment at La Chirera and what it was purported to be and what it actually turned out to be. There is actually on the McKenna Academy website, there's a 50-year retrospective on the experiment at La Chirera that we did 50 years ago. We did it on March 4th, 2021. I was started to talk about the McKenna Academy, and that's the connection in which this came up, because we did do that, and we put a number of events related to it or, or sessions related to it up on the Academy website. Dennis, how did your education and academic research career evolve from here? The people could look at ESPD55.com. If you register with your email and a password, it's all open access, and we had 37 different presentations over a variety of topics, and people with interest in ethnopharmacology, you know, if you will, the, the obscure back alleys of ethnopharmacology, the frontier of new psychoactive uh, drugs, not necessarily psychedelics, but many of them are then that's a very informative website for people to look at. One of many presentations that were done there, but the one that I presented and that we're focusing on and is now kind of the Academy's main program is something called Biognosis. Dennis, can you talk about your Biognosis project and the herbarium and the documentary associated with it? And can you also talk about how, via this project, you're trying to bridge science and traditional knowledge? If you go to the uh, program website and look for Biognosis, you can see, you can view that presentation. It consists of two parts. We are hoping to do a series of documentaries about the current state of Amazonian traditional medicine. And we completed the first documentary, which we showed at this conference, And uh, you can watch that from the conference website. It's about 30 minutes. And then following that, I have a presentation about this project that we're doing. So under the umbrella of Biognosis, we have basically two prongs or two fronts of this project. One is to complete a series of six to eight short documentaries about the uh, current state of ethnomedicine in the Amazon, which, of course, has been impacted by all the factors that are impacting the rest of the world, climate change, globalization, COVID, all of these things that are disrupting the world are similarly having their effect on these societies, these indigenous communities there, who nevertheless are surviving and who still rely on plant medicines to support their livelihood. So we want to make these documentaries and sort of present a snapshot of the current state of traditional medicine there in the face of all these challenges, the kind of post-COVID, post-ayahuasca tourism era that we now find ourselves in. These communities are impacted, but they are changing. Obviously, they're going to change in response to that. And we want to show that and as a way also of documenting the knowledge that they still have, most of which is not in any kind of written form. It's in the oral traditions of the people. And along with the habitats and the species, the knowledge is also threatened, in danger of being lost. So we hope that this uh, 
documentary series can help to preserve that and bridge science and traditional knowledge. And then that leads to the other side of this project, which has to do with the herbarium in Iquitos at the university, the Universidad Nacional Amazonia Paruana, or UNAP as it's called. They have an herbarium there. And the curator of the herbarium is an amazing botanist, a person I've actually worked with for 50 years. He was a student when I was a graduate student, went to Iquitos for the first time in 1981 to do my field work. And he was a forestry student at the time, and he was the person that the then director of the herbarium told, you know, take this gringo to the field and get some plants for him and bring him back in one piece. You know, he's totally clueless. He doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> but I, I mean, I didn't witness the conversation, but I imagine that's more or less what the conversation was. So Juan Ruiz did that. He took me out to collect and he did bring me back. And we've worked together ever since on various projects. And now of course, he's getting close to retirement. He is now the curator of the herbarium, and uh, he has just an incredible store of knowledge, but it's all in his head. He doesn't write things down. And so part of this documentary project is to do extensive, in-depth interviews with Juan Ruiz in the field and in the herbarium to record what he knows before it's lost, before he retires or passes on. He's in good health, as far as I know, but, you know, he's almost as old as I am. So, you know, not too many years left, and it's important to record this. You know, if, if the knowledge of the Amazonian biome in this region is, is concentrated in one single individual, it would be Juan Ruiz. And uh, he's one of these people about whom it's sometimes said when a medicine man dies, it's as though a library has burned down, you know, and Wanneries is the library. And so uh, one aspect of this project is to document his work, first through videography, and then that will probably turn into also a book. And then the other side of that project is the herbarium itself, which is a gem. There's about 150,000 specimens in the herbarium, but only about 50,000 of them are actually mounted and entered into the library. So there's 100,000 that are still in the collection bags that they were in sometimes 20, 30 years ago. So a big project is to unpack those and get those things integrated into the herbarium, make high-resolution scans of all this, digitize, get them mounted first with herbarium labels and so on in the conventional way, and then make high-resolution scans of all these specimens, integrate that into a database, which is then can be uploaded and can be accessible to anyone, anywhere. It will be an open-access more or less open access resource for anyone with an interest in, uh, you know, in, in the science or any aspect of the Amazonian flora, you know, and also will include these interviews with Juan as well as the uh, other documentary segments of the local community. So the whole idea of this Biognosis project is to build a bridge between the scientific body of knowledge and the traditional knowledge of body of knowledge that will enrich both sides. And uh, that's going to take three to five years and probably cost multiple millions. We're not sure exactly. We've kind of put a stake down that, that you know, we need 10 million for, to, we need to raise 10 million to do this project properly. And that's about right. You know, it's going to cost about that much to do it. Is it worthwhile? Well, it depends. You know, if you think so, the objectives of this are are several, but one is to just document this knowledge before it disappears. You know, and, and bring it into the twentieth century, upgrade the herbarium so it becomes at least online a resource that is uh, useful for science 
scientific investigators as well as the local people. We want to we want this to be a participatory project so that they have input into it. They from their communities can, you know, upload data that that they feel is important about the use of these plants. And the idea is that if you can attach information to these specimens, each specimen in the herbarium tells a story. Every specimen has a story, just in the sense that someone felt like it was important to collect it and people had different reasons. It means that somebody somewhere at some point went into the field and made a specimen out of that plant for various reasons. So that becomes a node of information, and that node can be linked to other information resources, such as genomic resources, phytochemical, ethnobotanical, and so on, databases that are out there, and make this a effectively a dynamic learning tool that is available to the entire world that everyone can uh, benefit from and learn from. And the hope is that this will help demonstrate to the world the value of this bio, which is disappearing, which is threatened. If we can develop a consensus that it's worth preserving, then perhaps as a collective group, we can try to slow this down you know, through international NGOs or or whatever mechanisms. So the $10 million investment, even though it sounds like a lot of money, is actually just the seed to get this thing started. And then eventually we're going to have to uh, apply to NGOs, maybe the UN, various global agencies, the World Health Organization is another prospect to provide sustaining funding for this. It's valuable to preserve the knowledge because it's the right thing to do, you know, to to try to preserve this knowledge. But it's also, if we want to look at it in terms of dollars and cents and just actual monetary value, it's valuable in that respect too. Because potentially there are blockbuster drugs to be discovered in the Amazon only a small fraction of of the Amazonian biome has ever been examined for any uh, potential source of new medicine. So just on that alone, it's worth preserving these species. How do you put a value on a plant that is a cure for AIDS or cancer that grew in a forest you cut down last week? You know, you've got to be able to preserve these habitats and this knowledge. It, It all goes together. So that's that's the academy's biggest project now for the foreseeable future is is to get started on this documentary series and start raising money and begin to sort of get our arms around what this herbarium project is is going to entail. You know, we've got uh, several people that have had experience with this kind of thing in other countries, so they know how to come and take a look at it and uh, and assess what it would take to uh, make this a world-class resource for researchers. If you go to the Biognosis, if you go to the ESPD55 program, search on Biognosis, uh, the presentations, and then you can click watch. And if you watch the, the video, the first uh, half of it is the documentary, and the second half, is my pitch about this herbarium project. So, and uh, in the middle, there's a, a short clip from Greg Hemmings. Greg Hemmings has a documentary company in New Brunswick that we're working with and uh, called Hemmings House. And he has a short piece uh, talking about the value of documentaries for social impact and environmental activism and that kind of stuff. So it's it's worth looking at. And, and this video is going to be released to the public unrestricted in the next couple months. Right now, you have to go to the conference website, but it'll be out on uh, various platforms real soon. If people are interested in that, they can watch this. If people, especially if if people want to support this, you know, we do need the the support. We are a 501c3 and they can send an email to uh, me, Dennis at McKenna.academy, or they can send an email to connect at McKenna.academy and somebody will get back to them about 
about that. We welcome one and all. Now, the Amazon is the heritage of all humanity. You know, the indigenous people have been the stewards of these habitats and this knowledge, these plants, for thousands of years. But now it's up to the rest of the world to step up and throw our collective efforts together to to try to slow this down and preserve what we can while it's still there. Dennis, are you ever going to retire? Well, uh, talk to me in five years. <laughs> you know, I, I may, I may. I mean, this this may be the last the last major thing that I do. But I figure as long as I'm cognitively functional, I may as well keep after it. I mean, I'm passionate about this. I've been blessed to uh, to live the life I've lived, and I'm still engaged. I may have slowed down a bit, but I'm, in some ways, I'm as excited about it now as I was 50 years ago. And it's even more urgent now to keep working on it. I'll retire one of these days, but I'm in no hurry to retire. You know, I really want to bring this project forward as much as I can. And then I'll think about, probably never will retire, but I might step away from this and write books or do podcasts or things like that. I am going to continue doing podcasts and uh, I think that's one effective way to get the message out. And speaking of books, I guess I can plug my book. The uh, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss uh, is coming out in a new edition. In February, I have a second edition, and uh, Synergetic Press is publishing that, and that will be coming out. And it will be effectively the same as the book that I published originally in 2012, but I've written a new chapter for it, so it's got a 50-page new chapter. Ten years, a lot of things have happened in ten years. So the chapter is basically a reflection on all of that and where we are now and maybe where we're going. Can you touch a little bit, Dennis, on some of the pharmacology behind the most common psychedelics known to the general public right now? Sure. So psilocybin and psilocin are obviously the the psychedelic molecule in the magic mushrooms. They're tryptamines. They're part of this family of tryptamines that contains, that includes DMT and 5-methoxy DMT and bufotenine. All of these are part of the tryptamine family. I think of it. They're structurally related. Psilocybin and psilocin are unique in a couple of ways. For one thing, they're the only phosphorylated indoles in nature, as far as we know. So that phosphorylation, psilocybin is for phosphoryl and dimethyltryptamine. Psilocybin is a prodrug, what pharmacologists call a prodrug. It's converted to psilocin in the body, and psilocin is the active form. Psilocin is 4 hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. So it's very, very close to DMT itself, and it's close also to bufotenine. Bufotenine is 5-hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. Psilocin is 4-hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. So the hydroxy group is just one carbon over, but that makes all the difference because bufotenine is not, it's not even clear that it crosses the blood-brain barrier, although it probably does, but it it's not orally active. Most of the DMT, 5-methoxy DMT, these unsubstituted, so-called unsubstituted tryptamines are not orally active. They require a monoamine oxidase inhibitor to be activated, and that's the basis of ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a combination of a plant that contains DMT and a plant, the vine component of ayahuasca is contains this other group of indole alkaloids very close to related to tryptamines called beta carbolines and these are very potent selective inhibitors of monoamine oxidase which is the enzyme in the gut that basically chops up the dmt before it ever gets into the circulation so by inhibiting that enzyme the DMT is preserved, it can be absorbed, and it's orally active. So it goes from 15 minutes duration, which is about what it is when you smoke it or or snuff it, to several six or seven hours. 
duration, although the intensity is less. It's still the tryptamine dimension. Psilocybin and psilocin don't require any of that. Psilocin is happily orally active by itself. It doesn't require an MAO inhibitor. And so in some sense, it's a cleaner drug. You know, if one ingredient will do the trick, why do you have to have two? And psilocybin and psilocin are extremely compatible with human metabolism. They're non-toxic. And in some ways, they are the perfect clinical psychedelic because uh, they can be given to people in a fragile state of health. And generally, they're not toxic and people can tolerate them, even if their health isn't that good. And uh, duration of action is about right for a clinical study or a clinical session. You can come in in the morning and uh, take the substance, and by late afternoon, if you're pretty much back to baseline, you can go home and have dinner with your family or whatever. So it's Interesting that nature's come up with what's almost the clinically perfect psychedelic in a certain way. And there's nothing light about the experience. I mean, depending on the dose, psilocybin experiences could be as profound as any psychedelic, as LSD or ayahuasca or DMT or all of these things. They can produce a deep and profound mystical experience, psychedelic experience. But at the same time, they don't put your body through a lot of changes. You know, like ayahuasca is usually purgative, and that's okay. That's understood in the traditional context. That's understood to be cleansing and good for you, and it probably is. But it's also, you know, disruptive in a certain way because you have to pay attention to what it's doing to your guts. And psilocin doesn't have that problem. Most people do not have any nausea or anything. So it's very smooth and you can just concentrate on what's happening in the experience. And it's very generally, although it's quite strong, it's not threatening usually, you know, although you can get into some pretty challenging places with it. But in general, it's a, it's a friendlier psychedelic, I would say, than, say, LSD or, or some of these other things. Dennis, what does set and setting mean to you? And how does the default mode network come into play with all of this? With the proper support, and this is what, we, you know, what we've known really since the 60s uh, or before that, if you look at the indigenous traditions, set and setting, these important variables of set and setting, they are uh, stepping out of your reference frame. That's the whole point, you know, is that they temporarily disable what the neuroscientists now call the, uh, the default mode network, and what I prefer to call the reality hallucination. You know, this hallucination that the brain creates for itself that uh, is not really reality, but it's a model of reality that's useful for us, you know, and helps us cope with all this information that's coming in from outside that we have to process. But sometimes you want to shut that down. You want to open the gates completely. And a lot of what the brain does is is, uh, exclude or selectively filter what you can experience through your sensory channels. And uh, uh, psilocybin can temporarily disable that, and everything floods in, both from inside and outside, and creates, uh, you know, a profoundly altered state. And so you want to be careful about the set and setting. You know, uh, you want to do it in an appropriate way circumstance where, number one, you know that you're safe. You don't have to worry about all those things. You know that you're being uh, looked after by compassionate people who are there to support you if you need it. And uh, just uh, you want a situation where you feel free to surrender to the experience, you know, and focus on what is happening rather than all the real world considerations that somebody else should should worry about you know should so that's that's the idea of having a structure uh as a proper set and setting 
and you know the the setting obviously needs to be safe and enjoyable whether it's outside or inside that's a matter of choice and sometimes it's great to do it in nature if you can get far enough from people that are likely to interfere with your experience <laughs> or you can just do it in inside and and listen to music selecting the right music is really important but then the set is the other important variable and and people uh, sometimes they say well the set is you know your intention what your expectations are and it is all that but i think the set goes beyond that the set is really you the set is what you bring to the table if you are and that's your whole life and your experiences and your your issues if you're there for therapeutic purposes maybe you're there because of trauma or you know addictions or uh, anxiety and depression if you're looking for a therapeutic outcome so that's part of the set that you bring to the experience. And, and I really do think that the interaction with the medicine is kind of like a partnership. You know, you're, you're, you're opening yourself to this intense interaction with this medicine. You know, the, the supporting structure should be as light as possible. Something that's kind of unique about the psychedelic experience is that you can't delegate, you know, you can't tell somebody, go have this psychedelic experience and, and then I will get the benefit. It doesn't work. Uh, you can't delegate your death. You can't delegate your birth. You can't delegate making love. You can't, you know, and, and, and the psychedelics are kind of in that category. You know, you have to do it yourself, which means that you have to create optimal conditions for it. And then you have to surrender, trusting that you've done that. You have to trust yourself and the medicine, and you have to have a certain amount of courage to be able to do that, to you know, let go and say, okay, I've done all I can to prepare for this and let it rip, let it happen. And uh, that's the formula for an ideal therapeutic or even recreational, you know, outcome to these. You know, in my view, you can't really separate recreational and therapeutic. A recreational experience can be quite therapeutic, you know, and uh, it doesn't have to be with a doctor in a white coat in a clinic. In fact, it's probably better if it isn't. In the clinical studies, they, they make an effort to provide a, you know, a, a nice space like a, a, a living room or something where people can lie back and listen to music and whatever, and that's the right approach. And then you have the whole indigenous approach with where it's really a group ceremony, but it's still a comfortable space, and it's it's usually structured through sounds, through music, and that kind of stuff. There are many ways that you can structure a set and setting that's appropriate for a psilocybin trip. But the important thing is that there is a set and setting, that it's something you've thought about. They should be taken thoughtfully, not carelessly. That's the way I feel about it. Dennis, what's your connection to the non-psychoactive medicinal mushrooms? Do you use any of these medicinal mushrooms in your everyday life? Do you think that they have an impact? What's your perspective? We'd be really curious to hear from your ethnopharmacology lens. I do use them in my in my life, uh, and thanks to uh, Sky and Jeff, they make sure I have a good supply of medicinal mushrooms. So I take uh, quite a few herbal supplements. Of the ones I take, I'd say at least half of them are fungal fungal supplements. So I take their immune formula, five defenders. I take either turkey tail or reishi. Sometimes uh, I take lion's mane for cognitive function. I think that these things are beneficial and they're certainly not toxic. You know, the compounds that are in them are beta-glucans in the case of the, uh, but the immune stimulating. So that's, you know, simple sugars basically. And I think they do actually stimulate the immune system and even prevent cancers and this sort of thing. So why not? I do think that they have value. My personal feeling is that taking these immune stimulating formulations has kept me healthy for years. I have been doing it for years. I'm not a person that gets colds and flus and that sort of thing normally. I did recently get 
COVID, but that was <laughs> that's uh, that wasn't the mushroom's fault. You know, that's a matter of being in the wrong place at the wrong time during my quarantine and so on. I continued with my medicinal mushroom supplements and and uh, boosted the dose a little bit, which you can do. There's really no toxic level. You can take grams of these things if you want to spend the money. But I did, and I really felt that that helped keep the experience short. You know, it only lasted a few days. It was pretty mild. And again, I, I just think that has to do with having a basically healthy immune system. And I think the mushrooms really help with that. I'm interested to try one of their new products, the uh, ergosterol-containing mushrooms supplements. I have some samples here. I just haven't integrated in, into my regimen. I think they're uh, doing a great job. You know, I mean, they, these are products that are benefiting a lot of people and their quality is very high. And so more power to them. I've known Jeff. Jeff is one of my oldest friends. Our friendship goes back, you know, more than 50 years. You know, you get old and then you realize you have all these friends who are also old. <laughs> back in the day, you know, we were change makers, but we're still still very close and I respect the work that, that he's doing. And I don't know if it's for public consumption, public discussion, whether it's proprietary or not, but maybe I can put this out there and you can edit it out if they don't want to talk about it. But Jeff and I recently started a, a little research project. I should include Sky as well because he's helping set up the lab, but, but a little research project to collect all the known species of psilocybin-containing mushrooms and make a culture bank of these and grow all these in, in the lab just to have the genetic diversity and to have that available for researchers because they're not all the same. That's just kind of a cool project. Those things would be available to people and to explore the chemistry and formulation and so on. And we, uh, or Jeff, I should say, applied to uh, Health Canada for permission to do this. So it's all legal and above board and kosher. And it's just a obvious great idea to have all these different strains available, because then you can look at the molecular biology and other secondary compounds that some may have and others don't. So I'm kind of excited about that project, working with uh, Namex and real mushrooms on that. Dennis, what is your opinion on microdosing? Do you believe it is something that is worth all the hype right now? I think it's possible. I don't have anything against it. I just think there needs to be better research, you know, on this, on the benefits. That's in general true when it comes to this whole area of microdosing. Microdosing may be beneficial, but I think there needs to be more research. I mean, uh, Paul Stamets has, is an advocate of this. He's also a friend, and I respect his work as well. And he's published some interesting work on microdosing. In fact, if you go to ESPD 55, you can listen to his presentation, which he uh, talked a little bit about the stone date theory uh, at the beginning, but then basically it was a review of his work on microdosing. I mean, I think all hands on deck. I think anybody that wants to work on this is uh, should be, and he's publishing in peer-reviewed journals. So that basis, I assume that his work is well-conducted. And of course, there are lots of anecdotes about people claim that that microdosing helps with their cognitive functions. And other people say, well, it didn't seem to make any difference. And, and measuring a, a non-robust effect like this is difficult, you know, uh, especially when you're talking about cognitive response. How do you know it's not just placebo? And so to really look at that, there needs to be some well-structured studies. On the other hand, if people want to try it, there's really no hazard with it. I don't think there's any problem stacking these different combinations, you know, because all of these are inherently non-toxic. So I guess if you want to make your own formulation, something similar to the statement stack and try it, check it out. Nothing to stop people from doing that. Dennis, how does psilocybin interact with common medications like SSRIs? 
And can you take us through the pharmacology and again, the impact that has on our body? I mean, of course, psilocybin and, and these similar compounds, they work on serotonin. They work on this particular subset of serotonin receptors, the 5-HT2A receptors, which is the target for most of what I call the true psychedelics or the classical psychedelics. The SSRIs don't really work on receptors. They work on the serotonin transporters, and they increase the concentration of serotonin in the synaptic cleft because they're selective reuptake, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So there's more serotonin in the synaptic cleft. So if you combine that with a 2A agonist like psilocybin, chances are it's going to attenuate the effect of psilocybin or psilocin, rather. It's going to diminish the effect because the psilocin is competing with the serotonin for the receptor. So it's probably better not to use them together. You have to get off the SSRIs. Dennis, how does psilocybin and its serotonin receptor activation impact neuroplasticity, mental health, and things like mood disorders? I think you get a cleaner therapeutic response if it doesn't have SSRIs in the mix. Then you get a, a cleaner response to the depression. You, you, you give it more opportunity to do the things that it does. As we know, synaptogenesis, neurogenesis, it actually enhances and changes the architecture of neuronal networks over time. And uh, these are probably why you have these long term benefits from just a few exposures, you know, one or two sessions. And it's a rapid, it's a rapid response, relatively rapid compared to SSRIs, which can sometimes take weeks to really see any perceivable effect. And often the effect is close to placebo and very hard to sort it out. Dennis, is there any new research in the psychedelic world that you're really looking forward to or really excited about? I think that uh, the psychedelics are the next generation of antidepressants, in a sense, and, and other things as well. So I'm very happy to see that finally this has really been investigated. Psilocybin particularly in other psychedelics, if there's such a thing as a broad spectrum neuropsychiatric medicine, it's it. And it is because of this ability to reframe your reference frame, you know, to step out of this default mode network and look at your situation from a different point of view. And in that sense, under uh, you know, sort of defuse it, get a handle on whatever your issue is, depression or addiction or trauma or anxiety or your even your impending death if you have a terminal issue but it's it's the ability to step away from that and look at it from a different perspective i think that's at the core of the broad spectrum therapeutic effects of something like psilocybin i do not have much faith there are People, various people working on modifications of the psilocybin molecule and other molecules, essentially trying to take the trip out of the drug, you know, to engineer the molecule so that you don't actually have a trip, but you have the therapeutic response. It tweaks you on the molecular level, on the neurological level, and you get over these problems. I personally don't believe that they're going to be effective. I'm a skeptic. I think that you have to have the actual experience, you know, in order to integrate these changes. But I could be wrong. I hope not. I think that as human beings, we need to have these experiences. I think that they make us better humans. They make us kinder. They make us more intelligent. They make us more aware of our relationships with nature and each other. And these are valuable experiences. And a molecule that doesn't do that, that is supposedly a non-psychedelic psychedelic, well, the term is absurd. If it's not, if it doesn't produce a psychedelic experience, 
it's not a psychedelic. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, it may be based on a psychedelic molecule, but it's not psychedelic, and it won't give you that experience, and it won't give you the benefit of that experience. It may make changes. How is that any better than a SSRI, you know, which we've had for decades? There's an abundance of scientific data that shows that they're ineffective or very, very often not much more effective than placebo. So why spend millions of dollars to develop non-psychedelic psychedelics so that they can avoid what is, I guess, perceived in, in these people's minds as an undesirable side effect. I thought the psychedelic experience was the desirable side effect. When I was a postdoc at NIH, I used to have this conversation with my supervisor because we were we were looking at uh, these 5-HT2A receptors, mapping the, their distribution in rats' brains and so on. And, and he said, yeah, and if we can come up with a compound that can block this effect, you know, we can have an anti-psychedelic. And I, I said, well, Dr. Saavedra, I thought we were looking for better psychedelics here. He wasn't. <laughs> very receptive to that idea. But I do not think you can uh, separate the psychedelic effect from the therapeutic effect in this class of molecules. That's my own personal bias. I challenge them, anyone, to prove me wrong. And I think they're going to spend millions and millions of dollars on what's essentially a dry hole. It's not going anywhere. Dennis, how can these plant and fungal medicines help society become closer to nature and have a greater connection to nature? Well, I think the true psychedelics, you know, that the, what I call the true psychedelics are the psychedelics that actually cause a psychedelic experience. I think they're very valuable uh, to help us uh, get a perspective on our place in nature, you know, it, they because they, again, let us step out of this reference frame psilocybin and these other things, but I think particularly psilocybin, you can make the case that they have been symbiotic partners with the human species, potentially for millions of years. I mean, that's the whole stone date idea, which, you know, we're coming to the end of the podcast, so we won't go down that, but I do think that they have influenced uh, the evolution of human consciousness language and cognition, which are the basis of culture for potentially millions of years. And so they are true symbiotic partners. And many, many people who are taking them now, and I think this has always been the case, have come away feeling like they have a better understanding of who we are as a species and how we fit into the community of species, how we fit into nature and what our real destiny is, that's an invaluable experience for an individual. I think that these things are medicines for the soul, you know, but you have to accept the proposition that we have a soul. If you have a medicine that will treat the soul, ergo, we have a soul. And I, I think that they heal the soul of individuals, but also the, of societies, of collectivities of really and of the species as a whole, you know, and we've gotten so far out of sync with nature that, you know, we're now learning this hard lesson and thank the Lord, thank nature that we have these, these molecules that can help, help us reframe our understanding to nature. That's the first step toward fixing the problem because we're so out of harmony with nature that, you know, we're rapidly destroying it. And this is not what sane and rational beings do. You know, this is what crazy people do. And as a species, we've kind of lost it. You know, we have this collective psychosis that we're laboring under and this, uh, you know, effectively inability to acknowledge what's happening our relationship to nature and the and the impact we're having on it. So I think if these are medicines for the soul that work on the individual collective and and species level, you're not going to get that from an engineered molecule that doesn't have a psychedelic experience. I'm sorry, it's a waste of time. But that's only my that's my bias. <laughs> well thanks for uh being on the Real Mushrooms podcast and interview series. It's a 
It's an absolute um, pleasure to have you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you.